Hello everybody, this is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 62. Thanks so much for joining us today. We have a wonderful guest, as we always do today, is A.M. Jester here on the uh, video line. Uh, but before we begin, I should say Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. If you love poetry as much as we do, which is the only reason we do it, we just love poetry. And if you love poetry too, please do click the like button or share or rate us on iTunes. Um, we really, we don't have enough. I have a lot of iTunes views and not a lot of ratings. And the truth is, I don't know how to rate things on iTunes. Um, I'm not sure where you do that. But if you're listening on iTunes after the fact tomorrow... Please like try to give us a rating because that would be cool. Um, but also click the like button um, on YouTube. Click the bell and make sure you're getting notifications. Um, anything you can click tells computers that uh, this is a good thing to listen to. And if it's a good thing to listen to, other people will listen to it more. And uh, that is how the world works these days. So please do click something right now. Click something. I'm serious. Click it. Okay. So um, for the warm-up poem today, I just clicked the random button. Speaking of clicking things... And I came across this poem by Leslie Wheeler, which um, I thought was interesting because um, I the uh, Apple came out with the 5G iPhone today. So maybe that's kind of the future here. It sort of ties in, strangely, to that. This is science fiction from mission number 38. And uh, here it is. Why don't you give it a listen? This is uh, Leslie Wheeler with uh, science fiction. Oops, hang on a second. I, one setting was wrong. Here we go. Let's try it again. This is Leslie Wheeler with Science Fiction. Science Fiction. No Jack at the nape of the neck. No Mars colony. No teleportation. No flying car jaunts with your friend the cyborg. However, you may own a cell phone so tiny you can't see it without cochlear implants requiring you to hire an immigrant child with delicate fingers to press its microscopic buttons. Don't listen to me, a poet, specialist in memory, not speculation. This future tense thing is just a game. Ridiculous to guess you will still read poems in the bathtub and the steam will make you feel sexy. Green hair today, you'll decide, dictating commands to a sleek plastic quafferator, thinking of moss sparkling deep inside the book's virtual glade. Water will stream off your skin as you emerge, laying down the words that transport you. Humidity makes tech buggy, but moss likes moisture, just keeps softening, thickening, so real and verdant now, so clean-smelling, language falls away. So clean-smelling, language falls away. I love that poem by Leslie Wheeler. Um, I loved her note, too. I'm addicted to the book as transporter device. Novels can certainly pull you into an alternate reality, but some poems can, too. Um, I love that po uh, book as a transporter device. That's a cool uh, cool way to put it by Leslie Wheeler. Um, Leslie, um, she's a writer and professor born in New York, raised in New Jersey and residing in uh, Virginia. Her fifth book of poetry the State She's In is now available from Tinderbox Editions. Uh, and find her at lesliewheeler.org. That's L-E-S-L-E-Y, wheel, E-R, dot org. Uh, lesliewheeler.org. Find her and her books there. But that was a wonderful poem to warm us up. And now let's move on to our uh, featured guest today. Um, A.M. Jester, we interviewed him in round number 55, so you can get a lot of his backstory uh, from that uh, interview, edition number 55. That was a tribute to civil servants. Uh, his latest book is Wonder and Wrath, which just came out uh, a few last week. Um, Am Jester is an award-winning poet, translator, and critic. His most recent books include John Milton's The Book of Elegies, The Elegies of Maxim Maximianus, and Sleaze and Slander. <laughs> and his first book of original poetry, The Secret Language of Women, won the Richard Wilbur Award. Uh, Jester's poetry, translations, and essays have appeared in poetry, the Paris Review, all over. Um, in addition to that, he's had a long career in the federal government, where he worked as uh, senior positions for four presidents twice in the White House, including six years as Commissioner of Social Security. He lives outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and here he is, A.M. Jester. Hey, Mike, how you doing? 
Hey, good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's it's my pleasure. Um, we had you for a wonderful workshop and reading uh, last fall, right about this time at, at uh, Red Hen's Hen House. And um, yes. it's good to see you again. Um, do you want to start out by reading a poem? Sure. So uh, why don't I start off by reading a translation? I'll mostly read my own poems, but I do think that we get a little parochial, um, even in our translations. So this is... Um, a favorite of mine, uh, appeared in poetry. I believe it's the first appearance uh, in, in, in English of a poem tra poems translated from, uh, from Oromo, which is an East African language, um, doesn't have a country of its own. People, about 50 million people, uh, Kenya, Nigeria. When I first started working on this, I was working off anthropological texts almost 25 years ago. Um, and I think there was concern that because it was a purely oral language, it would disappear. Um, and in fact, um, over the 20 years that I spent working on this, um, they developed their own uh, alphabet. It's become much more institutionalized, and it's, um, it's a pretty thriving, secure language now. But it wasn't when I first started working on this. So these are proverbs. Let the relentless fist be kissed. The salt cannot be cooked. The past is overlooked. Full once they nibble, fleas quibble. Teeth in a hyena's face always slide into place. No donkey can cart what weighs down your heart. Outside, a man is respected. At home, that man is neglected. The strangers weep and leave. Family members grieve. Even half-blind men hope to see again. True words end, lies extend. And that's for East African Proverbs, uh, translated by yeah. A.M. Jester. And, you know, I, this was my favorite, probably, translation, actually. I love just the, the insight of each of these. They were really cool to read. Um, yeah, it, it, was, it was hard, kind of. With, I, I was drawing from a pool of over 4,000 of them and I played around with it for a long time and at some point I decided I needed to boil it down to a to a handful that I thought were really pretty amazing in one way or another. What, what was it like? I, I, I wanted to ask because um, obviously when people when I see people translate poems I imagine that they um, you know speak the language but I, I can't believe that you speak Oromo, French, uh, Middle Welsh, Latin. I think you, I assume that you don't speak eight languages. So what was it? Well, I don't, <laughs> I don't speak Oromo. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have at least a working knowledge of all these. I, generally, I do like to translate only in, in um, languages that I have a, a rough, at least a rough reading knowledge oh, of. Oh, wow. Hopefully somewhat better. So how many languages but, do you have a reading knowledge of? I mean, Middle Welsh? <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, I, I, I um, start off, as I usually do, trying to teach myself. Um, it's cheaper and a little bit more pleasant. Um, and then you hit a sort of a point where you have to get a little bit more serious about it. So I'm, I'm blessed in Boston that I can indulge myself there. So I've taken uh, Latin and Middle Welsh oh, wow. and Old English at Harvard and taken Italian at Tufts. So. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, so what, as a translator, um, what, what is your sort of idea for translating? Like, what is your model? Like, what are you trying to accomplish Um when you're translating a different text? It, it's changed over time. I, I first started really just as an exercise. And so just getting published was kind of, you know, the goal. And at some point, a few years after I started, I, I got a little bit more serious about it. And I started looking at book length um, translations. Uh, I started with um, fairly well-known texts, but that were not frequently translated i mean at some point you know at least in, from my vantage point it would seem arrogant for me to try to do the 75th translation of rilke or, or some of these other poets are very frequently translated because i just don't think that what i would do would add very much so uh i started with horace's satires and then tabullus's elegies um and as particularly as i got deeper into Latin. I'd been away from my Latin for a long time. Um, I started noticing that there were a lot of interesting texts that hadn't gotten translated. There's a classical scholarship is still 
distorted by biases of 19th century Mm -hmm. British scholars who identified strongly with the Roman Empire, British Empire, Roman Empire, and weren't real happy when it started becoming Catholic literature, you know, uh, in the second century. So basically, um, classics departments stop at about 100 AD. And of course, Latin was the language of literature for most of Europe for another 1500 years. So it meant that there were a lot of really interesting texts that hadn't been translated. So I was on kind of a mission for a while uh, to, to do that. And I had a good time with it. Um, I still probably will do more of that, but I've gone back a little bit to my uh, original ambitions and then raised the bar on myself. So the first book I ever tried, I failed. I gave up about 8% of the way through, (laughs) um, which is Petrarch's Canzonieri, which I still think doesn't have a, a really satisfactory translation. So I started again last December and I'm doing almost nothing else. And I have a little schedule for myself, both on a long term and a daily basis. And I'm a little bit better than 60% done in a little bit less than a year. So I'm hopeful that I'll be done some point next year. And I am talking with a major publisher about um, publication, which is pretty exciting. Um, and um, and again, I think it, it's it's offering something that's not out there now. It's just, it's very hard. Um, None of the available translations is written in rhyme. Mm -hmm. And you think for Petrarch, how essential that is to the sound and the music um, of it. And, um, and I also think, you know, I've thought a lot about Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey and how, you know, she stripped out a lot of the uh, assumptions of the past that really warps the text. And you got, I think, a much, in addition to getting a metrical version, you got a much cleaner, more accurate um, version. And, and I know she gets her back up about it being called a feminist version because one of the things that got um, stripped out was some of the um, euphemisms about attacks on women and things like that. But what she did was much broader than that. She hasn't really gotten enough credit for it. And I feel similarly about Petrarch, I think um, a lot of the earlier translations relied on sort of this phony conception of um, courtly love that never existed. And, um, and then more recently, there have been a couple philologists that have done major translations, and they're good for what they are, but they're totally unreadable as poetry. Um, and I don't think poets have really gotten past that yet. So I'm hopeful that at some point next year, I will, um, I'll have a draft that will be something new and exciting for people that want to read Petra. Yeah. So, so is that your philosophy then to try to, um, bring the music back into the language? Cause I think of, um, Eugenio Montale, who I love, yes. um, in his translations by Charles Wright, I don't speak Italian. Um, and Charles Wright has these really loose sort of it's it's half Charles Wright, half Montale. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and I love those translations, though. And then I read I think it's Aerosmith that does um, sort of the most most of them. And they're much more literal. And there's just they don't have the music, but then they're not they're not accurate to what Montale was saying either in the Charles Wright version. So how do you strike that balance between being literal and being musical? Because it's hard to do both, it would seem. That's like the, yeah. the translator's dilemma, I guess. It is. Well, I, and I love Montale. I started off doing some Montale. It's the first Italian I, I ever did. And, but it was difficult to get the rights. And so I just went back to dead authors where I didn't <laughs> have to deal with agents and lawyers uh-huh. and, and things like that. Um, so generally, I think people view my translations as pretty accurate, um, not taking the liberties that are pretty common with a lot of um, translators. I think for the Petrarch, it's a little bit different because when you have to come up with just two rhymes for the first eight lines of every sonnet and then either two or three rhymes in the sestet, it's, um, it's challenging, you know, particularly if you're not going to be using the same rhymes over and over again. And so you have to kind of decide what goes. And I don't really want the sense to go and I don't want the music to go. Mm-hmm. And so other things go. Um, 
the syntax goes a little bit. And of course, Petrarch's syntax is often a barrier to understanding because it's very gnarled. And, you know, sometimes syntax carries meaning. I, I don't think that's particularly true for Petrarch. So that's one thing that goes. The other thing that goes is uh, for particular words, you view them as much more elastic than you might if you were just doing a free verse or a blank verse translation. And so, you know, a word gets out there and, and it can become a phrase or a phrase can get compressed into a single word. Um, you know, you move back and forth between passive and active voice a little bit here and there, if it's helpful. Um, and at the end of the day, I want to finish and say, this is a poem. This is something I could stand up and read in front of an audience someplace on a college campus or a bookstore, and people would understand what it's about. And I think the other thing that kind of has gotten lost with Petrarch is that how revolutionary and how vital it was because people were not writing in the vernacular and what he was doing linguistically was very experimental and very raw and very new. It doesn't feel that way sometimes when you read the more literal translations because he's been so widely imitated. So trying to capture that sense of novelty, trying to get, capture that sense of passion. And it really is, I think in a lot of ways, the first confessional poetry mm. Interesting. Um, and um, uh, sort of capturing that sense of self-interrogation, which often has gotten softened by translators, I think is really important because in some ways I don't think we'd have Plath and Sexton and Lowell if we hadn't had Petrarch. Um, you don't have any Petrarch in here, do you? I don't, I don't, no, yeah, okay. no, I don't. Well, do you want to read another translation of someone else, just to, and then we'll sure. move on to other poems? I should say, as you as you sort of figure out what you want to read, that um, if anybody has any questions for Mike, um, just uh, let me know through the chat window. I am watching YouTube and Facebook, but not uh, Twitter and Periscope because that's just too much. I I already have eight windows up. I can't have a hundred windows up. But uh, but leave your comments in YouTube or. Uh, or Facebook, and I can pass them along if you have any questions for uh, Mike. But but what would you like to read next, Mike? Well, I'll read a, a short one, which which you had the good good judgment to publish. Um, and I think, as best I can tell, this is the earliest poem by a woman objecting to domestic violence. Um, a woman named Guerful Mehen. Um, it's 15th century Middle Welsh. Um, she's a real badass. I mean, I mean, you know, medieval poetry by women was a little rare, not as rare as I think people thought 25 years ago. Um, and it was sufficiently radical that often what they did was pretty safe. Mm. Um, boy, this is a woman that, you know, anything that the male poets, um, did in, uh, in Wales, she felt that she could and had to do. And, you know, and so she's got some body poetry. She's got some very raw religious poetry. Um, and again, this is a one where I differ from the academic translator because they've done the academic translator has done the um, the easy thing of translating the pronoun with some liberty. And, it, and so it's it's to my husband um, is how it starts in. Uh, well, actually, I think two academic translations. In fact, the, well, the Middle Welsh pronoun is ambiguous, um, and it really is best translated as to her husband. Um, so you don't really know whether it's Mehen's husband mm -hmm. or whether she's standing up for another woman, which she did in other circumstances. So this is you know, one thing that fascinates me as a translator, probably not for people who are listening, <laughs> but you know, I, I puzzled over this pronoun for weeks trying to figure out you know, what was the, the right way to go with it. So anyway, yeah, that, that's so the this thing is that makes the translation so fascinating. It's those little tiny details that change oh, really yeah. everything. You know, the poem is totally different if um, it's about her husband versus someone else's. I, I spent a day and a half on one line of Petrarch a few weeks ago. So, you know, it's, you know, it's a, so um, this is a, a form called an England. It's only four lines. Um, three of the lines rhyme um, with N rhyme. There's an internal rhyme. Um, there's a lot of alliteration um, in it, too. So it's, it's, it's a fun form to write in. So this is called To Her Husband for Beating Her. Through your heart's lining, let there be pressed 
slanting down, a dagger to the bone in your chest. Your knee crushed, your hand smashed. May the rest be gutted by the sword you possessed. Yeah, it's such a great little poem, little four lines. It's a great one. What is the form yeah. again? It's called an England, England. E-N-G-L-Y-N. Yeah, that's the only time I've seen, I think you mentioned it like when you sent that in. And it's the, I think it's the only time I've seen one of those. Um, let's see. So so um, one of the things that I'm always just so interested about with you is the the pen name thing. And the, yeah. um, you know, because you're, you're Michael Astrew, um, the right. public servant, and um, with a long political career, uh, and you've been writing for such a long time as A.M. Juster. Um, can you just explain? I know we talked about it in the interview that we did uh, in Rattle, but, but can you explain why you chose to use a pen name rather than your regular name? It, it's just something that always interests, it interests me. Yeah, so I, um, I wrote poetry a lot in high school and college, and I took a couple of um, poetry writing seminars in college. And the second one was a disaster um, and very discouraging, and I stopped writing for more than a decade. And then I restarted and decided that I really wanted to uh, write the kind of poetry I loved, which was a formal poetry, instead of the fairly imitative postmodern poems I was writing in college. Mm -hmm. um, although the, the professor was rather a jerk, um, he wasn't entirely wrong probably, um, you know, as well. So I was teaching myself. And at that point, I was in my mid 30s. Um, and I was general counsel for the US Department of Health and Human Services. And I'd been working at it for a couple of years. And I was starting to think about publishing. And just as I was starting to do that, uh, the um, I believe it was the Office of Government Ethics issued an edict saying that every employee had to get a, approval for anything published, whether it was work-related or not, from uh, one supervisor. <laughs> and um, I kind of thought about that. And I said, oh, geez, you know, I really don't want to have to go to a cabinet official and say, here's some of the, this wonderful poetry I've been writing. Yeah. And, and so the thought of, well, what are your options there? And, and, and I thought, well, then about writing under a pseudonym. And I said, well, that's not really terribly you know, honorable thing to do either. But then after it crossed my mind, I thought, well, you know, poets don't really take people seriously um, who've got um, jobs in government and business and that type of thing. And vice versa is true. Yeah. yeah. So, so why, why not sort of keep some privacy and, you know, and particularly if this is a flop, then no one needs to know. <laughs> and the only way it's ever going to be a problem is if I get to a certain level of success that I want to try to achieve. So I was pretty happy with that. So I, I went um, 17 years, 17 years with the, the pseudonym. Um, and I got outed by um, the largest of the labor unions at Social Security originally. They did not like the fact that um, I didn't just give them the keys to the agency. And so they were determined to try to drive me out. And so they had this whole effort to try to find dirt. Um, one of the people on their committee sent me taunting emails at home on a regular basis. Oh, wow. um, but they didn't find anything. Except at some point, and I don't know how they figured it out, um, they figured out that I was had been publishing poetry. And so they fed it to somebody who usually was reliable, um, you know, uh, uh, on the web for tearing the agency and me apart. And he didn't know what to do with it. Um, so it was just kind of out there. And at that point, um, Jody Bottom the ed was editor of First Things. And he'd been trying to out me for years and to do it nicely. So when he found out that I had, in fact, had a very quiet outing. He persuaded me to cooperate with uh, a very nice profile that Paul Mariani did in June of 2010. And at that point, you know, the, the secret was out. Yeah, I um, 
you know, I just have such mixed feelings about it because I, I wish that we lived in a world where that wasn't the case. But at the same time, I think it's genius to do um, use a pseudonym. And I kind of wish that I um, was an editor under a pseudonym, too, <laughs> and just published everything. Because, um, I don't know, in the world of social media and things, everything sort of comes back to get you. When I was... Um, yeah. Issue number, I think, 32, maybe, of Rattle has an anonymous member of the U.S. Congress. Um, it's a po- ah. it's a sonnet in that issue. And um, and at the time, it was before we met you, I think. And um, and I remember him, you know, he, well, I shouldn't say he, he or she <laughs> um, said, um, you know, I just don't want it to be used as campaign fodder that I'm writing poems, too. And at yeah. the time, I thought, oh, God, that is so tragic that, that a poem that you write would be campaign fodder. And um, today, he, uh, he or she was on, uh, you know, Twitter and stuff. And, um, and I don't know, it's an anonymous poet who writes poetry on the side. And it's pretty good poetry. And, um, and I don't know, how do we make, like, like why is it that, that poetry isn't um, something that, that you would want people to know that you're doing in Washington, D.C.? That is such a, such a fascinating and, and also depressing question. Um, but, but what is it about poetry that you think that makes it something that, that a Congress member would not want to uh, share? Well, it tends to be very personal. Mm-hmm. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I think sometimes almost too much so, where, where people treat it more like a journal than art. And so in some ways, I actually, and again, I'm not saying this is part of my reasoning, I mean, because I'm not smart enough, but at some point I started appreciating that it was helpful to the poetry because when I took criticism or I was editing, you know, I, I didn't have quite the same feeling that I think a lot of other poets have that as sort of like tearing my heart mm-hmm. out and, and, and doing damage to sort of something fundamental to my soul. I have a little bit, I think it gave me a little bit more distance than is often um, the way. And I think, I think that's, for me anyway, I think that was actually helpful. Yeah, there's a sense, um, just as an editor, where I'm like, if I'm rejecting, a, we use the rejected is like even what um, submittable says, which what everybody uses now. And if you, I mean, they use decline, I guess they use decline, which is better. But in the same way, it, it feels like people feel like they're being rejected as human beings rather than just yes. being rejected as a poet. So there's just so many reasons why a pseudonym works better i think and um yeah. i think maybe more poets should do it especially in the in, you know, in the 21st century anyway where um there's just so much going on um but do you want to read another poem sure let me, uh, let me read one that probably should come with a trigger warning so it's called i sit half naked I sit half naked with my socks still on, my gown half open, because this teaching hospital believes that dignity disrupts efficiency. And all there is for anyone to read is one brochure in Spanish, El Dolor, which after 37 minutes gets my full attention, then before long gains my full approval as I dwell upon what doctors call depression. And the way that term suggests a highways dip and rise not the last lonely exit on a road to nowhere, growing narrower and dark until you stop, besieged by underbrush. Then I remember how economists contend that a recession's depth portends the strength of the recovery to come. Thus a depression should be followed by a geyser of exuberant new goods, which is a promise mostly left unkept. And finally, how tropical depressions pummel shores. Then shortly later, grace unblemished sky with unexpected azure but spanish it abhors our metaphor so el dolor a sadness with no bounds or schedule only unspecific loss describes a world of closed dead circuitry that leaves us mourning those we lose to grief the door snaps open and i hear him say sorry i'm late so how are we today and that was uh, i sit half naked from A.M. Jester's newest book, Wonder and yeah. Wrath. Um, over on uh, YouTube, Richard Westheimer says that, that it's, uh, poetry is truth-telling, but not factual, and it's way too subtle for Washington speak. I think that's a good way to put it. Um, you have a request. I don't think it's in the book. Um, I don't know. 
Um, uh, Lisa McCabe asked if you could read November Requiem. Do you happen to have oh, yeah. that no, it's near in, you? Yeah, it's in the book. Oh, it is in the yeah. book. Okay. Yeah. Got to find it. Here we go. 32. It's on page 32. Okay, thanks. November Requiem. Wood sways and mutters. Palsied shutters bang. The call has come. Stripped of starlight, night dwindles to gritty lavender and gray. Mad jags of wind keep drowning out the surf. We dress, then slog toward beach plums to, through. Uh, we dress, then slog through beach plums to the bay. Three days before, we calm three bottle noses, then lit an exodus into the channel to confront the bellowing Atlantic. We roared and told eyewitness news that tides or virus-damaged years had made them frantic. Now we return. Salvation did not last. Just yards from shore, they do not move at all, except to veer away as we draw near. Their faith in our benevolence betrayed, and their desire for surrender clear. And that was November Requiem. Uh, by request from Lisa McCabe from request? from Wonder and Rat. Canada from Canada yeah. I guess yeah we t yeah we take requests here on the Rattlecast so um, if anybody has any feel free to um, ask along so so you've done so much with your life um, you you know in addition to working in, in public service you've worked um, in I think the pharmaceutical industry biotech I, I dry, <laughs> particularly in those days it was a pretty sharp distinction between biotech and pharmaceutical <laughs> not so much these okay days. yeah so you've done that you've done um, um, charity work too. Um, um, what is it that, that you're sort of driven by? Because you've done so much. Of all the people on the Rattlecast, maybe, you've probably done more um, and had sort of a, a more varied and sort of driven life than um, anybody I can think of that we've talked to here. What is it that, that drives you through so many different domains and interests, and, and poetry included? Um, yeah, I, I think from a very young age, I, I wanted to try to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I'm, I was a child of my era, so I was heavily influenced by John F. Kennedy. I was heavily influenced by Sputnik um, and, uh, and, and, and seeing science as a, uh, a way to improve life. Um, I, um, when I was in elementary, early in elementary school, um, not that far from the Edison Library, and so we had two or three field trips there. And that just absolutely ignited my um, imagination for a while. I wanted to be the next Thomas Edison. Um, so it's, um, uh, so for me, when I left the government um, and um, I, I went into a law firm briefly, I was in a law firm twice briefly, and I'm just not a law firm kind of person. Um, I found that biotech gave me a lot of the same satisfaction of being in public service, that you go to work every day trying to do hard things to benefit people who are somewhat identifiable. Um, and, um, and that meant a lot to me. There was a point when I was at Biogen and starting to be very successful as a journalist. I won a lot of high-profile litigation. You know, it's that difficult, contentious part of my personality. And um, a very large... Um, I'll say, you know, I, I, I got pursued by Staples when they were a hot new company to come in and be their general counsel. And they were offering a lot more money than I was making, you know, at the time, at least in terms of base compensation. And, um, you know, I turned it down and my wife said to me at breakfast, well, why did you turn it down? And I said, it just, I don't want to wake up every morning thinking about legal problems of office products. <laughs> so for me, you know, trying to cure rare diseases, you know, trying to do things that really matter to people that are suffering. Um, both my parents died of rare diseases. And so that was, um, you know, part of the fuel, I think, too, for getting involved with uh, that area of biotech. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, wanting to change the world. Um, how do you think poetry changes the world? Like, why is poetry meaningful? You know, a lot of people, probably if you polled, um, people in the United States, they would say that everything else you do 
um, has more of a, a, a positive influence on the world than poetry. So what is it about poetry that's, that, that puts it in that category too for you? Well, I'm an outlier these days, particularly these days, because I think a lot of poetry doesn't really have the possibility of making much of a difference. I think increasingly it's a linguistic game that people out of MFA programs play for other people in MFA programs, usually people that know them in one way or another. Um, and it doesn't even, it's scornful of trying to talk to ordinary people. Um, I'm starting to get reviews for this book. First one that came out was very negative. The whole idea that you would try to write something that um, a serious academic or critic would find interesting as poetry, but also would be speaking to a broader audience it was kind of, you know, they're kind of saying, well, you know, that's a stupid thing to do. Um, but I don't feel that way. It's an older, I mean, I'm, I'm looking, you know, to Auden and Richard Wilbur and, and Derek Walcott and Haney and, um, you know, poets like that who managed to write, I think, serious art, but also, you know, address broader concerns that a general audience can, can deal with. And so I, I view it as a little bit like um, being a preacher, that you've got a podium and you have a willing audience that's trying to learn something. You should get up and you should try to say something meaningful and you should say it um, in a memorable way if you can. And so that's really what I'm about. Increasingly, I mean, I'm really disturbed the last five years um, that poetry is heading so much in the opposite direction that, you know, you get to a certain, you know, level of success and all of a sudden it's getting harder rather than easier to get published because the screeners just look at anything that's um, accessible, um, written in meter or rhyme, even if the meter or rhyme is pretty innovative, um, and they just reject it. Um, so it's, it's frustrating, but, you know, I'm not going to change, you know, what I do for that, because I think there's still enough venues out there. And I think the, the publication, where you get published doesn't matter as much as before, because social media is really where um, you build your audience. Um, and I've actually been quite pleased that, you know, I'm building an audience on Twitter. I've got over 5,000 people, you know, at, at AM Juster. Um, and, um, when I publish something, you know, I, I'm able to get it out to that large group of people. And then there's a multiplier effect when those people retweet and that kind of thing. And I think actually, therefore my poem, even though it's harder to get published in journals, I'm getting my work out to a much broader um, population, and I'm happy about that. So, you know, I'm not, I'll whine a little bit, but not, not too much. Um, you mentioned the last five years, and um, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, but to me, poetry has gotten really political in the last five years. I think that's what I, um, I don't know if that's what you meant, but that's how I sort of interpreted it. And I feel like the problem with political poetry is that it's coming from a perspective that's sort of, you know, pushing a, a an opinion that's sort of pre-existing. And it's sort of, um, you know, it's, it's more rhetoric, I think, than the pursuit of sort of understanding and learning, which is what I feel like poetry um, really is. Is that what you were referring to? Or, or In part. I mean, part of it is, I think there were some wonderful editors of top journals who were receptive to formal poetry, and some of them wrote it themselves. So you had J.D. McClatchy at the Yale Review. You had George Core at Swanee Review. You had Willard Spiegelman at the Southwest Review. And I could go on. And they all basically left at more or less the same time. And they've been replaced by people that are, I think, coming up with the ethic that you're mentioning and that I've talked about, too, where um, there's really very little interest in reaching a broader audience um, it's very driven by identity politics and stylistically, you know, there's a very sort of narrow, um, postmodern style that's sort of actually pretty easy to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, publication becomes a lot more about sort of who, you know, and what your backstory is. Um, and, and that's, you know, that, that can be 
frustrating. And that is sort of taking over poetry. And I think it's killing it. Um, and, you know, and you look at what happened to Poetry Magazine, um, where trying to, you know, um, satisfy all the demands on an ideological basis, the place literally collapsed. And, and all these people that had been very well treated by poetry in terms of fellowships and publications and and attention and and focus on the poetry foundation website you know they all turned and and basically tried to pull the place down um and um unfortunately that's kind of where we are now and and you know it's a little poetry is sort of like portland oregon you know on a regular basis and um i'm hopeful that will change Mm -hmm. um i don't know that it will um, but my feeling is, you know, I'm here to do what I want to do in my way and speak to people in the way that I want to do it. And if the traditional, um, channels are clogged, <laughs> um, there's a lot of new technology. There's a lot of, you know, vibrancy out there. So I'll, I'll find my audience one way or the other. Yeah. Well, it, you know, I mean, and Rattle's attacked constantly too for, for similar reasons as poetry yeah. was. I kind of felt like we were um, past it when that, that Black Sun poem that Poetry published came out, which is when Don Shear shut his Twitter down after the criticism yeah. of that. But it's such an obviously sort of just strange interpretation of that poem that didn't seem to make sense to me anyway. And, um, and they just left it up and let the poet explain what he was talking about. I thought kind of maybe that was the end of um, all the, the, the strife there, but then uh, apparently not because everything is, is changed and they skipped an issue for the first time in 108 yeah. years or however long they've been around. Um, yeah. So it's definitely something we're going through. Um, you're, you're the editor, the poetry editor. Are you still the poetry editor first things or? or? No, no, I, I stepped down there and I've moved to a, a, a different publication. So I'm over at plow quarterly now mm. with the same title and sort of the same, um, uh, mandate. Uh, but it's been pretty cool. Um, the only been there a short time, but I've helped them pull together. Um, they're going to do their first competition. So they're going to be honoring a poet, you know, well, um, you know, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and so um, the, um, the award will start next year. I'm actually going to be getting eight poems of Rena's to plow probably tomorrow. Um, and they're great. You know, and, and it's just, I mean, what a wonder. I mean, she's 88 years old. She's full of energy. She hasn't, you know, she's just, and she's continuing to be innovative and creative. And one of these poems I looked at and said, Wow, I've not seen one like this from her. Because you know, I've known Rena for 25 years. Um, you know, I've been a loyal member of the workshop that she founded, um, and yet she's still doing stuff that knocks my socks off. So, so that's um, that's what I'm doing in in terms of other than writing poetry. Um, I'm mostly doing Petrarch these days, mm-hmm. but I'm doing a little bit for Plow. And um, still sitting on the board of the National Alliance for Hispanic Health. Um, well, I want to ask you more about editing, but but let, we haven't done a poem in a while. Let's do another poem. First. Sure. Uh, all right. Well, why don't I do what, in some sense, is the title poem? And it's technically it's not from the title, but it's it's buried at the end of the poem. Um, and this was. Um, the first of a series of experiments for me where I started writing in um, uh, Anglo-Saxon alliterative meter. Um, And again, this is where the translation um, affected me. So one of my projects that's on hold for a while, it's probably about two thirds done, is an anthology of Phoenix poems from half a dozen different languages. Um, And I've translated the old English Phoenix, which is long, it's about 700 lines. And it's, and I really enjoyed it. And I started thinking, well, you know, this isn't obsolete, you know, you could write a contemporary poems this way, and it would be, you know, it would have a vitality to it. So this is something I've done three, four or five of them, I think now. Um, but this is the first one. It's also in, a little bit sonic like because it's 14 lines, and it ends in a rhyme couplet. Three visitors. Oh, what page? Oh, here it is, 33. Oh, I'm sorry, page 33. I found it. 
Three Visitors. Mist on moon spill as midnight nears. Adrift but not dreaming, our drowsy sun is covered and kissed. At the kitchen door, our old basset is barking. Coyotes out back are standing like statues down by the dogwoods. Across the crystal of crusted snow, they search for stragglers to startle and chase. Their vigil reveals no victims this night. Trash would be trouble. They trot away unbothered by blood-throated growling and baying. No star distracts their stealthy march. As the highway hums, they howl through the calm, then savor new scents that spice their path in this world awash in wonder and wrath. Uh, yeah, that was Three Visitors from three visitors. from Wonder and Wrath. Thanks for sharing that, A.M. Jester. Um, so I wanted to ask how, because um, I think the first time we met, you'd never worked as an editor of poetry, and then you became the editor of First Things and then Plow. Um, how has right. that affected your poetry at all? Having you know reading submissions and that experience, because I can't help but but wonder how it's affected mine reading submissions every single day of my life. Um, <laughs> you know, it makes it much harder to write actually. Um, sort so being self conscious, it's it's very hard not to be um, unconscious in the way that you have to be to be creative. I think. Um, have you had any problem with that, or um, what have you learned um, in the process? I think if I had been younger when I first started doing it. I think it it really might have interfered with the creative process. Um, You know, one of the things about starting when you're 61, I guess I was, um, is, you know, you are a little stuck in your ways. You've kind of got, you know, um, a lot of what you want to do and how you want to do it down. Um, It was moderately interesting seeing what was coming in over the transom. Um, and I don't think it changed me a lot. Um, you know, a lot of it's fairly dull. A lot of it you can um, make a decision on pretty quickly. Um, there was an occasional kick. I think my greatest kick was um, uh, the way they sent it to me. They had the, the, the young fellows um, logged everything in, and they sent it to me, and I could see it on my computer, but I couldn't actually read it right away on my computer. I'd have to click on it but i could see sort of the shape and form Mm -hmm. so i could see the cover i clicked on the cover letter and it was from a college sophomore in in michigan and and i knew that that's probably a long shot but um and then i looked at the two pieces of paper and i could tell that one looked to be a formal poem from the stanzas and the other one looked more surely to be a um free verse poem and i looked at the formal poem first to give her the best shot and um and the poem was good it wasn't quite ready for publication but this is one of the things times where you say okay well you know you need to send an encouraging note Mm -hmm. um but then because i'm conscientious and and believe in dotting the i's and crossing the t's i read the poem that i thought was less likely to be successful and it blew my socks away you know, it's this wonderful meditation about looking over a college campus, seeing a building being renovated, thinking about Augustine. And, you know, it's, you know, it's a wonderful poem. And then, you know, the really special kick was I was at my, uh, my final AWP annual meeting. And I'm at one of these horrible conferences with, you know, not conferences, uh, receptions with you know trail mix and you know and 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 people trying to impress each other and it was just awful and i was like the wallflower Mm -hmm. at the dance right but i can overhear this group of professors who are about 10 feet away from me talking and one of them says oh man you wouldn't believe this student i have she just got her first poem published as a sophomore in first thing and i'm saying (laughs) You know, and for a split second, you know, I wanted to go over and say, yeah, this, yeah, I took that one. But then I thought, no, that's that would be tacky. You can't do that. But so, you know, you, you do get some times where you get some poems like that. And that's great. Mm-hmm. And there are some poems that are very good. But have a couple of flaws where you actually do. I actually did a little bit more editing mm-hmm. than I thought. And I, I enjoyed that. But, you know, the flood of submissions is not 
something that I miss. Now, the nice thing about Plow is um, they were doing mostly solicited poems, but they still were looking at an enormous number of submissions in order to take a couple a year. And so as we talked about this, I said, look, I mean, you've practically it's solicitation only. Anyway, why don't you go all the way? And, um, you know, and I think that will probably work better for us. So that's what we've done. So I'm not looking at piles of submissions um, anymore. And I have the um, real privilege of being able to approach people whose work I admire and say, you know, we'd like to publish. And, and Plow actually pays extremely well mm-hmm. by um, journal standards. So it, it's much easier for me and it's a lot less time consuming. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, it, that's interesting because we do the exact opposite. Of course, we don't. I've never solicited a poem except for like I interview a person and say, hey, could you send a few poems to go with the interview? Maybe. Um, and we'll look at some. And that's the only time we ever solicit. And because um, I feel like there's just so much poetry out there. Um, but but what is your experience soliciting you know, poets, because I, um, I don't know, just in the few times we do when it relates to an interview, it's always such an awkward kind of thing because you kind of, yes. you know, um, how do you, do you, do you ever turn poems down after you've solicited them? Because that's the thing that I'm sort of afraid of doing and which leads me to, in, in addition to many other considerations, um, that's one of the reasons why we don't solicit because I don't want to solicit and then turn people away after I said, hey, send me some poems. Wait, never mind. <laughs> um, yeah, not, not yet. I, I, I'm, I'm sure that will come at some point mm-hmm. and I haven't entirely thought through um, how I'm going to handle that. But for the most, so far I've asked people who are so good that I'm not terribly worried about it. Um, you know, I think the, the editors and, and I would both like to give some room for emerging voices um, and so I think when you do that, you need to be careful to ask for a broader range of poems because we usually publish two by a poet in a in an issue, um, you know, to to ask for four or five. So you've got a little bit of room to sort of sidestep that problem. What has surprised me is that the older, more established poets have generally jumped at the opportunity. Um, I've approached a couple of younger poets who um, one didn't respond. Mm-hmm to the email at all. And the other one responded, but hasn't actually sent me anything. Um, and so I don't, I'm not quite sure what to make of that. You know, it's, um, it's, it's funny that you should mention that because, um, you know, there are very few people who have not replied if I asked if they wanted to be on the Rattlecast and it's yeah. all younger people who have not like the, the couple people who, sort of, I don't know, ghosted me or whatever. Maybe young people don't use email as much as we do. <laughs> I don't know what the situation yeah. is, but I'm kind of, I was just today wondering about that because there's somebody I asked and um, I was thinking, oh yeah, that person never replied. What is up with that? <laughs> well, I approach both people through Twitter mm-hmm. and they're people that I'd had some Twitter, you know, some reasonable amount of Twitter conversation with. And so I don't think it was the medium. Um, it's just... I don't know. Well, quite well do you what think? Do you think it might be? Oops. Do you think it might be? Um, you know, I saw some people talking about first things as a conservative or, or right leaning magazine. Yeah. And, right, and it is. And, yeah, and um, and saying like, don't submit your poems there again with this political. Um, you know, everything is sort of a political perspective, and um, you don't want to contribute to. Do you think that has something to do with it? Well, I don't think so because you know at at. Um, at first things, I did a little bit of solicitation, and I did have some people who said, I just don't want to be associated with first things. Um, but Plow is much more of a, it's a little hard to characterize. Mm-hmm. Um, first, first things in is, general, is it's, Catholic, it's more right? middle of the road to leaning left. Yeah. So it's not the kind of journal that people are going to have ideological mm-hmm problems with for the most part i mean you never i mean people are unpredictable and you know you can't so so I mean, my, my impression I, i've never actually seen a copy of first things to be honest but um first things is a catholic um magazine is that right well yes and no i mean it's um it's a, clearly it's a a religious mm-hmm. and conservative journal it tends to lean particularly in recent years very catholic but it's technically not um and 
a number of the editors are not Catholic historically. Um, and, um, and the founder, I think at the time he founded it, was still Lutheran who, who converted to Catholicism. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, it is theoretically ecumenical, but it does have a Catholic slant to it. And they pay a lot of attention to um, Catholic theological disputes and that kind of thing. But it's not restricted. I mean, other theological issues, and um, they've run um, pieces by um, – Jewish thinkers, Muslim thinkers, and that type of thing. So it's it 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 sort of is and it isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, our um, you know, I had the, the first time we had a lot of negative feedback was when our, we did our law enforcement poets issue, um, which which um, you know I had some uh, some some uh, uh, messages. It was before the days of social media, really. But we had some letters that um, I can't even repeat. I I, I just don't want to. And um, and then the, the poets of faith issue. I was really shocked that um, the idea that anybody would sort of not be an atheist in the poetry world seemed to set a lot of people off. And then we had all these poems um, in the next issue that were sort of in a good way because I think you know reacting through poetry is really cool. But a lot of like atheist sort of leaning poems, which were really interesting to see too. Um, so so what do you think about the the skew of poetry away from? conservative thought and religion and things like that toward sort of more left and, and, um, and non-religious perspectives. Um, do you think that, that poetry is missing out somehow? Um, or do you think that, cause the, the, the fact is artists are high in openness, which leads people to be more left on the political spectrum. And, um, I don't know, that's something I always grapple with. So I'm, I'm always curious, you know, and I'm curious what your thoughts I, are about that topic. I think when you have a, I think that the predominant thought leans very heavily in a materialistic um, direction. They're not um, the whole notion of spirit, spirituality um, is is really rejected. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you can slide it in once in a while in kind of a new agey kind of way, but um, and I think that really diminishes a lot of the opportunity mm-hmm. for poetry. I think it's one of the things that limits poetry from reaching. A much broader audience. Yeah, um, it's it's one the of the biggest, most important topics. It reminds me this era that we're living in. Sort of reminds me of science during the um, um, the anti catastrophism age, where the guy I can't remember his name, who was trying to um, explain how the Missoula floods happened. Brecht, I think, is Brecht. Yeah, he's a geologist, right. and he was trying in the you know a hundred years ago was explaining that there were these huge floods that came through um, from Lake Missoula in one big catastrophe, and all the geologists said, no, that's impossible. Everything is gradual and incremental, and there's no such thing as like Noah's floods, so how dare you? And it took after his death to even be acknowledged, even though he had wonderful papers that were completely true. And I kind of feel like we're in that same era yeah. where yeah. talking about faith is, is something that they ignored. And, and it's coming from me, who's, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm a materialist. I'm not of any faith, really. Um, but I feel like we're missing out when we don't talk about, about spirituality and the larger picture. Um, well, well, materialism has become almost like a religion. And so they do treat people that are not with the program like heretics. You know, they really are, you know, shouted down and everything short of burning. And maybe we will see burning someday. But um, so I, I think the intolerance is a little bit of a shock for me because, you know, somebody who grew up in the 60s and 70s sort of got used to the idea that we would be more and more tolerant about speech and there would be more respect and deference to people from different groups and that kind of thing. And, and that's just, for me, that's part of my worldview. And so what I've seen in the last five years, because I've been subjected to some of this, um, uh, misplaced anger, you know, too. Uh, I even got um, blocked from one of the Harvard Twitter sites and had to go and file a complaint with the university to get that undone. Oh, wow. And, and you uh, went to Harvard, right? Am I remembering that right? I went to Harvard for law yeah, school, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm an alum. I pay them <laughs> for the privilege of using their library. Um, you know, I pay them because I, I take language courses and things there. Um, I've always been well behaved there maybe not other places but 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 are. and um you know it was a real shock to me um and um and, you know and they eventually did the right thing 
But the whole notion that, you know, Harvard would be shutting people out because they don't like the person's politics, you know, really is, it's pretty scary when you think mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, yeah, I agree, unfortunately. Um, Richard Westheimer has a, two great comments here, but Richard Westheimer says that religious poetry has the same weaknesses and possibilities as political poetry. If it involves surprise and discovery, it works. If it's didactic and positional, then not so much. Exactly. I completely agree. Yeah. And then, uh, and then Brent Stoffer says, even atheists got to love Hopkins. And, uh, that I got to agree there too. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, that's, that's exactly right. <laughs> and, and it is true. I mean, we, you know, uh, at first things we did get a lot of incredibly sincere um, poetry that was just very didactic and was not interesting mm -hmm. to read. And a lot of restatements of the Bible that didn't, didn't add any insight. I mean, I've written a couple poems that are, you know, reworking, restating biblical incidents, but usually to try to stress what I think is important from the scene that might not be understood, mm -hmm. you know, completely. But, um, so it's right, you know, you have to hold religious poetry the same aesthetic standards that you would hold other poetry. But fortunately, there's some people writing some very good religious poetry. In fact, there's a whole group of poets in their 20s um, and 30s, um, who I think are very good. Um, and, um, you know, they're starting to found journals and, and things like that. And like, you know, it's one of the things that gives me some hope going mm -hmm. forward. Yeah, it's interesting, too, because we, um, um, I, I met somebody, um, a, an aunt, I think, of a friend of a daughter. And um, she, uh, she was like, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, Rattle is a poetry magazine. She goes to rattle.com. And it was the Saturday, a couple of weeks ago, where we published a poem that was sort of Christian oriented. Um, by a by a young poet, like a a fourteen year old poet or something, and um, and she said, "Oh, you're with the Lord," <laughs> and then she signed up um, for our email list, and then um, on Friday, um, if anybody has gone back and read um, Friday's poem, which was maybe I could I can't remember the title. What was the title? Penda, I think it was just Penda and the Burning Bush. Um, what about? <laughs> About um yeah, pending and the burning bush, uh, Penda and the burning bush responds to a nigga who says he doesn't give head, and <laughs> and so she wrote me an angry email saying, "I thought you were with the Lord. How could you publish this filth?" And um, I think you know, there's sort of um, I don't know. I just want an era of tolerance where we listen to each other's perspectives, but it's so hard to find these days, I guess. So yeah. she's no longer a uh, email subscriber. That that she, she lasted a week. <laughs> <laughs> with yeah. you were gonna lose her sooner or later yeah anyway. yeah i mean it was due but um but it came as well anyway um <laughs> but we're almost out of time do you want to finish off with one last poem mike sure um maybe um maybe something a little bit more upbeat so unlike most of my poems this is largely based on a true story um when uh, my daughter was first learning uh, about Shakespeare in uh, junior high school. Fortunately, she didn't find this poem for another five years. And by the time she was in college, I, she reacted pretty well to it. I think she's actually pretty proud of it now. But I think if she had found it at the time that uh, I wrote it, she might have uh, felt differently. Um, so it's called Untamed Daughter. It's on page 44. Um, the epigraph is from the taming of the shrew. Um, come Kate, come, you must not look so sour. At 14, she loves being critical and tells me Shakespeare uses language well, but could have been like more original. I sputter, but rebuttals fail to gel. All those recycled plots make it appear to her. He was a sneaky plagiarist. No better than that girl expelled last year. So they should take him off her reading list. Please, Caitlin, let it go. Great writers borrow like gamblers. Don't begrudge the bar to source that he reshaped into Verona's sorrow, Miranda's tenderness, or Lear's remorse. But mark him down a point or two because he tamed a Kate as fierce as you. Excellent. That was Untamed Daughter. 
a poem from Wonder and Wrath, A.M. Juster's newest book. Um, thanks so much for joining us, Mike. It's been a pleasure. Um, as no, thanks for having me on. This is great. I really, I really do appreciate it. Yeah, I remember we had. A, I picked you up at some hotel to come to our reading, and we talked in the car for a couple hours through LA traffic, and um, it, it's just as much fun as it was then. So thanks so much for for well, joining me, and, and good to see you again. Good to see you. Yeah, have a good night. Yeah, so that was A.M. Jester uh, with his newest book, um, Wonder and Wrath, which I'll show on the screen. Um, one last time, this is Wonder and Wrath, a beautiful cover. It is from available from Paul Dry Books, which you can see right there, pauldrybooks.com, as you uh, can see uh, on the screen, just like it sounds. Um, and follow A.M. Jester on Twitter. He's very active. He's one of the most um, mo most active... Oops. He's one of the most active um, poets on Twitter, really, I'd say. So um, if you're on Twitter, make sure you follow him. Um, I miss Don Cher being on Twitter. He shared a lot of poetry stuff. Um, I'm not sure. There are a few people who do a lot, but but A.M. Jester is one of them. So um, make sure to follow him on Twitter at A.M. Jester. Now, uh, we'll move on to our open mic portion of the show. As uh, as always, you can call in. first. The first thing you should do if you wrote a poem for the prompt this week is send it to open mic at rattle.com if you haven't yet then you can send me a chat message over skype at rattle poetry all one word it's easy to find or call me at 818-850-7727 i will call you back when the time is right it doesn't matter how you do it um with the with skype we have video um with uh phone we don't but it works either way so um feel free to share your poems we have a whole bunch of people who sh sent your poems in this week uh, the prompt for the week was, oops, there you go. There's the prompt. Write a poem about an abandoned castle. That was this week's prompt. Let me make it a little bigger for you. Write a poem about an abandoned castle. So if you have a poem about an abandoned castle, uh, once again, send it to openmic at rattle.com. Then send me a Skype message at Rattle Poetry or send me a phone call. We have someone calling in right now, 818-850-7727. Um, I won't answer, but I will call you back when the time is right because that's how we have to do it. I am always calling from the future because there's like a 30-second delay. So um, that's why I have to do it like that way. So um, make sure you turn off your stream so you're not confused when the phone rings. And then uh, we will talk about it. So once again, this week's prompt was write a poem about an abandoned castle. And Megan didn't have a poem this week. So this is a week where I can write a better poem than Megan. I'm pr Well, I think it's like 50-50. Um, if my poem works as a poem, it'll be better than Megan's lack of a poem. Here's my poem. This is Treadwheel. And Treadwheel was like a hamster wheel kind of thing that they made in the Middle Ages to uh, do human-powered work, like cranes and things, and how they built castles, which I did not know, but they used treadwheels. So here it goes. Treadwheel about an abandoned castle. Treadwheel. The past doesn't go anywhere. It weighs like the stone blocks of an ancient wall half buried on a hill. Too heavy for thieves to carry. Too little to use. The hill itself is not a hill but a mott, hand dug in a decade of labor. The stones hoisted on a treadwheel crane. A man died digging the moat. A woman rested in the shadow of the wall, their only child running through the courtyard. They seem to be gone, but the dust slanting against the sun says otherwise. And tonight, children run through the abandoned castle of your arms, now resting in an easy chair, watching the evening news. The chair overlooks a golden river, on the river a boat, on the boat, just barely visible, the shadow of a figure gazes up and thinks how magnificent that castle must have been. That is my poem for this week, Treadwheel. And uh, let's see what you have. Oops. Let's see what you have. Um, we have a whole bunch of people who sent poems. Thanks so much for that. Um, let's see. So, so on the calling list, it's mostly the usual folks. I don't see any unknown names. Um, but Jose Gonzalez, let's see, keep sending poems. So Jose, please, uh, call in if you can. We'd love to share your work. I, I like, um, new people if possible is always nice, but let's go in the order of, uh, that requests were received. I think we have time for probably everybody. I'm not in any big rush tonight. 
Um, let's call up Angela Gartner first. We uh, missed her on Sunday, so let's talk to her now. Uh, pull up her poem. Hey, Angela, how are you doing tonight? Hey, how are you? I'm just turning. <laughs> okay, let me see. So I see, I hear you, but I don't see it yet. If you want to click. Oh, duh. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. One of those nights. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> yeah, good to see you. So, so how's it going tonight? Good. Real good. Just uh, lots of work today. That's all. <laughs> oh, yeah. What are you up to uh, for work? Um, we had a big virtual expo the other mm -hmm. day, so I was like trying, and now I'm I'm do, I'm in my Premiere Pro trying to edit video. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hate Premiere Pro. It's really fun. I, you know, editing audio <laughs> is really easy. Editing video is not fun. But <laughs> anyway, so yours was Reprieve from Castle Walls with T, and it's a um, a concrete poem. It looks kind of like a castle. I notice. It does, and um, this month I'm channeling Poe. So it is uh, another, another poetic kind of poem. But you know, he's so. I just loved like how he was always first per. You know, he did a lot of poems mm -hmm. in first person, and that's how he performed them too. So, you know, it's just like he had this rhythm that I will never have. But you know, I can try, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's hear. I'll, I'll show it for everybody. This is reprieve from the castle walls with T. Go ahead, whenever you're ready. Okay. Don't you see me bustling around this place? This castle is not abandoned. It's puzzling. I can tell, I can't tell if it's day or night. My doors and windows are gone. No one has sent me any invites or have come to see me in quite some time. I haven't been warm as the fireplace can't spark a light, nor can I write. My favorite pen just sits on the table. There are no maids to bring me food or drink. The men don't speak to me, if there are ones still here. In fact, my own last words I can't recall at all. But I do remember a grotesque smear of blood on my coat. The liquid dripped out down my shirt, then flowed in the cracks of the hall. I let it seep, filter, till I was dizzy enough to fall to the stone ground. You see, my son's knife wasn't entirely through. It was an artificial wound. I lay there thinking of his butchery. He saw me stand with my eyes twitching and a boiling inside from the heat of my indignation. There were wails for his mother and high-pitched yelps. He jumped off the stronghold's ledge, drowning in his regrets for trying to kill his impregnable father. I have hoped that he was properly honored at what awaited him in the obscurity. Now, I sit and wait for a reprieve. The loneliness and the cold makes me wish for tea. Oh, excellent. Thanks so much. It was Angela Gardner with Reprieve from Castle Walls with Tea. And I could hear the Poe in that. Speaking of which, is Poe, um, is that his real name? Because, um, you know, with, with A.M. Jester, I'm thinking about pen names. You know, Poe was kind of perfect for a poet. Was that really his name? Do you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, from what I know, it, it was his name. So. Yeah. Well, I think it... <laughs> it was. It was a... <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the, um, you know, the the... <laughs> the uh, simulation that we're all living in conjured up Edgar Allan Poe for all of us to enjoy or something like that. Thanks so much for sharing that, Angela. That was great. Oh, thank you. Have a great <laughs> okay, day. Okay, bye. Okay, let's see. Who do we have next? Let's do... I'll just go in the order received today. We have Richard Westheimer up next. Some great comments from Richard during the show today. Um, I'm trying to find his poem, though. Let me see. West... Hey, Richard, how you doing? I'm doing well. You know, as many times as I've done this, I do not get the 30-second delay at yeah, all. Yeah, it's always like, wah! Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't see your poem here. Um, did you email it to me? I sure did. It was, uh, the castle was abandoned for good reason. I can see oh, I, Let's see. Violet. Hmm. Let me check my spam folder. If the spam uh, sent me, if they sent you to spam, we are all in trouble. Let's see. If they yeah, sent well, you to spam. I can't believe it. You found it. Report okay. not spam. Yeah. I can't believe it. I mean, it's, it's not like we don't have interactions like every week. Well, maybe it's the content of the poem. Ma no. Yeah. Maybe the algorithms don't like it. Maybe that's like a rejection of your work by um, Google AI. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just, so far, I've only 
I've experienced it from editors. Now, now <laughs> yeah. I get it from people. Yeah. Okay. So this is the, the castle of Baden for good reason. Anything you want to say before you read it? Oh, this was such a, a an awful prompt. <laughs> I can see why Megan didn't do her own prompt. It just it was torturous to figure it out, and all of a sudden, it's sort of like like this is what clicked. Because well, I'll tell Megan um, it was torture this week. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sort of, sort of uh, the dungeon yeah. part of, of the castle. Okay. So the, the castle was abandoned for good reason. The blood libel um, refers to a centuries old false allegation that Jews murder Christians, especially Christian children to use their blood for ritual purposes. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Interesting. Oh, yeah. Uh, if if you want to know more about that, just read all the QAnon stuff, which is all based on it. Is it? Oh, wow. That's interesting. Not all, yeah. but certain aspects huh. of their, have to, have their to, madness yeah, is, yeah. Is, huh. echoes those things. The castle was abandoned for good reason. If I gather my family and friends inside these walls, which of the children will man the bastions? which will pour the boiling oil on the raiders raging from the city, and which will hurl rocks at the neighbors, who I think always saw our ways as suspect, and now believe we drink the blood and grind the bones of Gentile children. For the bread, they've been told, gives us power over their treasure. Right before the great undoing, after their mad king proclaimed that defeat was victory, before the wildings where white ragers savaged cities and state houses, we found this citadel, abandoned, rebuilt its walls, gathered in a few friends, bakers and farmers and fellow non-believers and the children who would become warriors. And we, like those who last lived behind these battlements will die deluded that we could abandon the good fight and turn our wealth into a fortress that would protect us from the madness. Oh, that was interesting, especially with that QAnon context. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Richard. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tim. Yeah. Have a good evening. Yeah, you too. Good night. Yeah, some great poems so far. Thanks, everybody, for sharing them. Let's see. Who do we have? Next. Next up is uh, Nivedita. Yeah, let's do Nivedita Karthik from uh, India, where it, I know now it is uh, 7 a.m. before she's got to go off to work. Yeah, some great poems so far. Thanks, everybody. Oh, just mute yourself for a second, because I could hear myself if you haven't yet. Or, I mean, mute me. Let's see. Yeah, I still hear myself. <laughs> ah. <laughs> what reason? Okay. We usually have a really good connection, but today is a bit iffy, so just let me know if something's not right. No, everything's good. Yeah, I think I just had to take a, a second to, to buffer or uh -huh. whatever. So good to see you. Thanks so much for calling again. First thing in the morning. Um, uh -huh. First thing in the morning, great way to start the day, like I always say. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So is there anything you want to say about your poem before you share it? Um, so my poem is more kind of upbeat and happy. It just talks about the lessons we can learn from an abandoned castle because it's not always bad. I mean, ruins have stories to tell. Mm -hmm. So let's just see what we can learn from not just a castle, though in this case it was a castle, but any abandoned monument has a lot to tell us. So that's that's just what I was going for this week. Yeah, that is definitely true. I'm, I love happy and upbeat, so let's do it. <laughs> okay, great. So can I start reading? Yeah, go ahead. The Secret Significance of a Deserted Dwelling This ancient castle once stood tall and proud, covered in ivy much like it is today, but filled with the sounds of laughter and gaiety, ringing out loud from the cavernous halls. Colorful banners flew high in the wind from the tall ramparts guarded by knights brave. It has seen wars and weddings and funerals and feuds galore. It has seen history pass before its glass paint eyes, and witness many a hero walk through its arched entryway. Yet, now it stands, derelict and abandoned, slap bang in the middle of this parkland that must have once formed the gardens of this magnificent estate. People call it an eyesore, say it spoils the pristine beauty of the park, but I, I call it an edifice of elegance, a testament to time, 
a beacon for the brave, a haven for the helpless, an emblem of endurance. Excellent. I love that ending. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for sharing <laughs> Thank that. Thank you. Thank you for loving me to share my poem yeah, here. My pleasure. Good so to much. see you. Have a good night. Or a good day, good I should you. say. <laughs> you have a good night. I'll have a good yeah, day. Thank we you will. So Thank much. you. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, let's see. Who is next in order? Yeah, that's the thing I love about... Um, in moving to California, I grew up in western New York. And what I don't like about California is it feels like there's no there's no like ruins anywhere. Like everything that was built out of stone or anything is 100 years old. And um, there's, so there's no sense of time. It feels weird living here in California. You know, in, in uh, Western New York, we had these old mills and things. Um, anyway, let's see how Brent's doing. Hey, Brent, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I, I am here. Ah, good to hear. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Can we hear each other? We can hear each yes. other. So, so how are you doing yes. tonight, Brent? Oh, I'm doing really well. I, I thought it was a really great show and a really interesting uh, poet and an interesting fellow on like a lot of different levels. Yeah, he's a kind of renaissance man for sure. Um, it's, yeah. it's always fun talking to him. So so what do you have? You have uh, Somewhere in Scotland. Is there anything you want to say about it before you read it? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, just um, my, my usual caveat of uh, I just wrote it and – Somewhere, somewhere in Scotland is a placeholder, mm -hmm. and um, I uh, the 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 final verse is where I want to go with the poem, but it's not really the final verse. It's it's an indication of where I want to go with it. Okay, well, well let's hear it. Let's hear it. Somewhere uh, oh. in Scotland. Okay. All right. <clears throat> the wild green hair of the woods is flung over leaning stacks of stone. All four towers boast long beards of velvet moss, their blank eyes encrusted with years of rocky sleep. Dandelions toss their blonde hair in the great hall, where stewards reeled to magical fiddles and mandolins. Brambles conquered the battlements, pink spears of St. Anthony's laurel charging out of the crumbled brick. Curtains of ivy drape the outer wall and shudder when the wind comes up from the bristling lake water. I want to lay down like an old castle and hear the grass whisper. This one, too, is mine. Oh, another great ending. I want to lay down like an old castle. I like that a lot. Somewhere in Scotland by Brent Stauffer. Have you ever been to Scotland, Brent? No, but when I was looking at pictures of old castles online, mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a lot of really good ones. Yeah, in, yeah. I really think there's two Scotland. places I'd like to go on vacation is either Egypt or Scotland. I think those are my two choices of anywhere. Yeah, well, and, and now because of the research that I've done, I'm really thinking I want to visit some old castles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. It seems fascinating. Kiss the old Blarney Stone. <laughs> get the COVID yeah. that way. If you're going to get it, get it right, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Brad. Good to see you. Have a good night. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tim. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Okay, um, let's see. Who do we have next? Let's call up Sally Dunn. I think we're... I think there might be everybody with video. So we'll have some calls coming up. Hey, Sally, how you doing? Doing okay. And do you want to share a poem tonight? Yes, I do. Um, I have to say, um, so I feel like I say this every time, um, I did write this in response to the prompt, but um, the castle sort of abandoned my poem at, after the second draft, so... Well, that's always great. You know, I like, it, it's more fun when people go in really, you know, far directions. So I'm looking forward to hearing it. This is Castles of a Sort. Uh, go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. Castles of a Sort. I abandoned my life one sweet summer day when I was five and sat yoga style under a horse chestnut tree. When she found me, my mother shouted right in my face, why didn't you come when I called? I didn't dare tell her I'd been dancing upon the wind above the trees. At 16, I came upon a graveyard deep in the woods, just a few markers in a clearing, trees sneaking closer, ever closer to the graves. 
I could almost see the ghosts rise out of their coffins, look at the approaching trees, and flee in search of a safer world. I laughed. I had learned things at five they'd soon discover. Those trees would sing up a wind, and their souls would dance a new dance. Excellent. That was Sally Dunn with Castles of a Sort. And yeah, thanks for sharing this. I, these poems turned out to be, um, I didn't think of the prompt this way, but I should have. These are great uh, introductions to the Halloween spirit. So I think it's a perfect time for them. That's true. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Have a good night. You too. Okay, let's call up um, Joy Stahl next. Is Joy the last one? Let me check. I think, oh, wait, we have Carla, too. So the phone's ringing. I'll find Joy's poem while we wait. Hey, Joy, how are you doing tonight? All right. Um, let me try to find your poem. Oh, here it is, My Abandoned Castle. Let me put it in a yeah, Word deck I, so I don't give away I your... did send a revised. There was a first one, and then there was a revised. So I have one four hours ago. Is that the newest? They were pretty close because after I sent it the first time, ah, then I put in the... You're right. I do. Uh, okay. I was looking at the wrong one. I'm glad you mentioned that. Let me uh, let me throw it in a Word doc really quick so uh, I don't have... So while your fans don't start emailing you. Okay. <laughs> my, abandoned, <laughs> my abandoned castle. Is there anything you want to say before you read it? Oh, no. Okay. Uh, oops, that's the wrong one. There we go. My abandoned castle. Go ahead whenever you're ready. My Abandoned Castle. I let down the rope of my braided auburn hair, climbed down, and abandoned the castle tower where I had been kept. Once, it was a nice castle. I was comfortably content. Perhaps I ignored cracks and walls and sagging foundation, dwelling in my own mind's palace. There was no reason to remain any longer. The one who placed me there had lost interest, stopped visiting, writing, calling. I finished all the books in the library. I wonder what will happen back there at the castle I left behind. Perhaps I should have left a note for the next chevalier. Sorry, but your princess is in another castle. <laughs> That's great. Another great ending. My Abandoned Castle by Joy Stahl. Thanks so much for sharing that, Joy. Thank you. Yeah, have a good night. Me too. Okay, I think we have one last person. Let me make sure um, Carla Schwartz is the last person left. Yeah, yeah, so let's call up Carla to close us out. And while we're doing that, I'll find Carla's poem. Of course, Carla is CB99 videos If uh, on the chat message and stuff like that. Hey, Carla, how are you, you doing tonight? I'm good. I'm good. I got the mute on before I answered the phone. <laughs> Excellent. That is that is a true pro handling the phones. Thanks, Carla. <laughs> so, um, so is there anything you want to say about this? I have what is not said. That's right, right? That's right. Um, so, so this, um, I was writing a poem and I was including some repetition, and I also, you know, I wasn't writing about a specific castle except for the castle that is my house. Okay. Ah, excellent. Okay, cool. Your your new castle. <laughs> uh, my old castle. Ah, your old castle. Okay. Well, go ahead whenever you're ready. I got it on screen. Okay. What is not said? What I haven't said. Your cat, who never roamed these hallways, haunted it, sliding between my ankles, tripping me up. Her name unsaid, forgotten until just now when I hit on that crumpled sticky note long abandoned in my memories library. What is not said 23 years of a woman's life, these 23 are a lifetime. What is not said, I filled these rooms, these living rooms with the detritus of living one life. What is not said, I was tenant in what could have been our home. What I haven't said, I called this house meant for two, us two, my palace. What cannot be said is what life would, ha what life we would have led, here, had you not spurned it. 
What I have not mentioned, all the what ifs, the dreams of dances, of arms, of kisses. What I cannot say as I clean the place out when I hold this photo of you squinting under a waterfall or your first letter to me, a declaration of sorts. I think of what might have been, say to myself, I must finally let go before casting them into the bin. What I have never told since moving into this house too big for one, this palace, this castle, never said before, abandoned, never explained what I couldn't. As I toss or pack, as the 23 years begin to unload, you suddenly appear six feet away and masked, stepping back into my life as if this house, which I now prepare to leave behind, conjures you, and you in turn invoke your cat by saying her name. You look like your cat did, white-haired now and black-legged, standing across from me, my stand of fruit between us, picking with a kind of ownership only a picker would have, with the familiarity of love undead, the love left to wander the halls of this castle, I too now abandon, as I stand here in the hollows of my house, ready to lock it for the last time. Hang on, I have to get to the next page. Oh, no. Uh, let me, oh, here. Sorry. As I walk the halls, my footsteps echo my goodbye. As I step away from this house, this palace meant for two or maybe more, this house now empty, I don't call your name. It doesn't echo. Oh, wow. That was a great poem. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carla. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that is What Is Not Said by Carla Schwartz. Thanks, Carla. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, I just love these. Um, the prompt poem, when we switched to this, made it so interesting to hear these, you know, everybody's different interpretations and then the insights into everybody's lives. It's just so fascinating to hear. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carla, and everybody who shared poems tonight. Uh, it's always really, really fun. Uh, let me see. Um, so we have a little bit of time. Vicky Miko sends a poem pretty much every week. And uh, I don't think she can make these later shows. But here's, we can do a Haiga uh, by Vicky Miko. Let me share this too. Uh, this is her prompt response. Let me make sure it's working here. The remains of her sand castle scattered by moon drift. The remains of her castle scattered by moon drift. That's Vicky Miko's high gun. There's a wonderful picture of sand and a star here. Um, so I wanted to share that too while we have time. Um, I'm, I'm sure Vicky wouldn't mind me sharing it even though she's not here. Um, for some other people who sent poems, I'm just not sure if, if they'd want me to share them without being here, so I'm, I'm not going to. But we have a bunch of other ones um, that I could, but I think I, I probably shouldn't. Um, so anyway, that is the show for tonight. Thanks to everybody for joining us. It was a lot of fun, as it always is. The prompt for next week is going to be, uh, here we go. That's not right. There it is. Write a poem from the perspective of a famous person, dead or living. Write a poem from the perspective of a famous person, dead or living. Um, I kind of assume that means in their voice, but maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Uh, from their perspective anyway. Write a poem from the perspective of a famous person, dead or living. That is next week's prompt. Hope you write a poem. And if you do, please do share it next week. This is a lot of fun. I love the prompts and seeing what people come up with. Um, next week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be Jessica Goodfellow. Uh, her book is Whiteout, uh, which came out a few years ago, but we published her in the newest issue of Rattle. The fall issue. We've also published her in a few older issues. Just a wonderful poet uh, living in Japan. And this book is about her uncle, I think, or nephew. I can't remember. It is about somebody, uh, I think her uncle, who um, died in an avalanche while trying to climb, I think, Mount Denali, if I'm remembering right. So the poems are about that and um, her, her remembrance of her uncle. And it's a wonderful book. She's an amazing poet. Jessica Goodfellow 
will be calling from Japan. It'll be Wednesday morning for her. But for you, it'll be Tuesday, October 20th at 9 p.m. Eastern, like always. So I hope to see you then. And in the meantime, hope you have a great night. Talk to you soon. Bye.